Welcome listeners. I am Susan Wachter, co-director of the Penn Institute for Urban Research. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the fourth annual Jeremy Nowak Memorial Lecture. Today, our program is on investing in arts and culture community. This is so important for us at Penn IUR, but mostly it's a reason to honor the memory of Jeremy Nowak. At his heart, Jeremy Nowak was all about creativity and the importance of community engagement around creativity. So it is with great pleasure that we join with the Reinvestment Fund in today's program. With that, may I hand this over to the Reinvestment Fund's leader, who again, it is, is carrying on and as mem many members of today's panel are carrying on the work of Jeremy Nowak. With that, let me turn it to Don Hinkle Brown. Thanks, Susan. I'm Don Hinkle Brown, the CEO of the Reinvestment Fund, uh, once known as the Delaware Valley Community Reinvestment Fund. Um, and this is such a great topic to discuss, both to um, gain an understanding on Jeremy's perspective on community investments and what he valued, um, but also him as a person, um, what he was most interested in. This was a field for us that had spurts of activity and opportunity and long periods in between of, of stasis. Um, and Jeremy was always very anxious to seize that opportunity when it would present itself to further our work. Um, but we should always remember that Jeremy began as a community organizer. And with the eyes of a community organizer, he would look at the occasional arts project in our pipeline of possible financing transactions and always be looking for the projects that facilitated community engagement. Uh, an arts project that failed on that regard uh, wouldn't stay in our pipeline very long. For him, Arts was about creating value in community and about uh, creating infrastructure that facilitated and enriched community connections. Um, he also saw arts projects as forums or platforms from which one could kind of uh, introduce the virus of community engagement and community development, even though the subject was really tie-dyed t-shirts. And, uh, you know, once you gather people, what they then talk about while their hands are busy uh, or they're engaged, it, it, you know, it, it was a little subversive that he saw arts as one of those venues through which you could listen to the community, hear what they're concerned about, but also uh, invite them uh, to view what could be beyond what they're currently doing in that particular room. Similarly, um, we ended up involved with charter schools very specifically because of the parent meetings that happened preceding a charter school, seen as a, an incredibly valuable platform from which to get an authentic connection um, to community participants. Um, Jeremy was not afraid of experimenting and our work in arts um, and community uh, arts projects specifically, uh, we were very comfortable and encouraged to proceed in advance of complete data. So we uh, didn't need to know everything about uh, a project's uh, mission values around connection. Uh, we merely need to see, to see the potential, right? So that ability to act before full reflection was one of Jeremy's really strong suits. Um, he had great instincts, but was also not afraid um, to experiment and then take from those experiments uh, what worked best and then go look for more of that. It was, you know, over a very long career that we began with this dabbling and this incidental finding great mushrooms of our projects and communities on through to much more database approach and then a very kind of structured academic understanding of what it all means and to be, create the proof for why it was valuable. And I got the pleasure of working with Jeremy through that entire arc. But in the very beginning, um, it was incidental and instinct. Uh, our very first loan at the reinvestment fund 
was a community arts facility in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, that underwrite, uh, which took a really long time, um, and you know, uh, as an organization that had not yet lent to make the first loan uh, and have it have those qualities of an after school program, an arts program, a community asset, and a venue from which other things happened all across the hours of the day. Uh, was a really gutsy transaction for the reinvestment fund to make. Um, but that practice stayed with us, always looking for and valuing those, what we originally called miscellaneous projects, right? They weren't housing. <laughs> they weren't in a clear category. We didn't yet have a category for them, um, but always valuing them as really special finds um, and taking from them what we could because at, at in those early days, we were building our network and we were building our community. And those transactions represented nodes of connection that were really valuable to us as an organization. Jeremy was also not afraid of challenging uh, those with low engagement strategies. Is that a euphemism for arts and cultural institutions, regional arts and cultural institutions, or those which had a kind of business strategy around exclusivity? Um, I had. A great Schadenfreude pleasure when Jeremy had the opportunity um, to fund or not fund things like the orchestra and the ballet uh, and things like that, and then challenge them. Be uh, you know going into the room with Jeremy as one of those institutions for the very first time. I I just wanted to be a fly on the wall, and I didn't have that opportunity. Um, but he would always challenge even our borrowers around their engagement strategies, around how they were connecting and how they were building these qualitative values in the community beyond the bricks and mortar or the program or the head counts of services. Um, so this was a very fertile row for us. And this showed up again and again in our work over decades as a very important place for us to play a role in connecting uh, community valuing investors to community arts projects. And I thank you all for being here to listen to all of us uh, remember and muse and, and expand upon uh, what we've all learned during our years with Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, Dawn, for those uh, for those words, and thank you, Susan, um, for convening this 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 marvelous this marvelous uh, memorial lecture. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marlon Buckner, and I'm the co-founder and principal of MB Squared Solutions, where Washington D.C. and Richmond, Virginia-based uh, consultancy. I have the great privilege of serving as a board member of the reinvestment fund and, um, and the honor of serving as, as your moderator um, this afternoon. Um, we are here, uh, as, as Susan and Dawn indicated, to honor the extraordinary legacy of, of Jeremy Nowak. And, um, and in, in order to do so, I think Dawn really put his finger on it. We want to do that in a, in, a, in a manner that meets the, the, the high engagement bar that Don just indicated Jeremy, Jeremy set. And in order to do that, I wanna invite our panelists, um, uh, our distinguished panelists uh, into this discussion to, to very briefly introduce themselves uh, and, and, and so that we can dive into what I know will be a vigorous and wide ranging uh, discussion. Um, I'm gonna start with Mark, uh, Mark Stern and ask Mark to very briefly introduce himself. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Stern. I'm a professor of social policy at the School of Social Policy and Practice here at Penn, and I'm also the principal investigator of the Social Impact of the Arts Project here at Penn. Thanks. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Judy Lee to introduce herself. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Judy Lee Reed, the president and CEO of United States Artists. Um, I'm in my third, second week on the job. Uh, and just prior to uh, joining United States Artists, I was the director of the Creative Communities Program at the William Penn Foundation. And Jamie, could you please introduce yourself? Hey there, I'm Jamie Bennett, and I'm the former executive director of a 10-year fund called Art Place America, which was created as sort of part of Jeremy's legacy and this whole work. And so I'll share a little bit more about that in a bit. Terrific. Well, thanks everyone uh, again, and thank, thank our panelists for joining us. Um, I want to start, I want to open the discussion up um, and, and, and 
ask people to consider the what what we've really come to appreciate as as Jeremy's argument um, in rereading his 2007 work, uh, Creativity and Neighborhood Development. Jeremy described arts and cultural activities as having civic and economic benefits that that certainly deserve support on on those bases alone. But he was he was quick to point out and and and. And central to his argument was that that beyond the um, the research that justifies and promotes public investments in arts and culture, principally on economic grounds, he made a very clear and powerful argument for an approach that recognizes place-based benefits in much broader terms. Don put his um, uh, uh, put his finger on that a little bit earlier. So I'd like us to start there, and and I want to go uh, first to Mark. Mark. Let's deepen for us, if you will, Jeremy's argument and, and help us understand how cultural activity and neighborhood development really, in his view, have complementary and in some ways intertwined missions. Uh, thanks, Marlon. I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, Susan Seifert and I were fortunate enough to work with Jeremy, Ira Goldstein, and their colleagues uh, on the project funded by the Rockefeller Foundation to synthesize the state of knowledge on culture and community development and to identify promising avenues in the field. One of the surprises of that collaboration that Don already alluded to was the discovery that Reinvestment Fund had already in 2007 invested more than $35 million in cultural and arts related projects. As part of the project, Jeremy authored Creativity and Neighborhood Development, which was his most systematic statement of the rationale for investments in cultural work. Three of the important takeaways I see in that monograph are, first of all, his notion of the architecture of community, his take on the different elements needed to make a functioning neighborhood. Secondly, uh, he made a point around the unique role of artists and other makers. In fact, it was before makers became a thing uh, in distressed urban neighborhoods. And then finally, the development of new flexible financial instruments, including what Jeremy called a creative neighborhood fund to, as he put it, support creative activity within communities as it emerges in relatively organic ways. I wanted to take a minute to review Jeremy's idea of the architecture of community and to assess how well it's aged over the past 15 years. Jeremy began his discussion of the architecture of community with a striking assertion. The community is a process, not a static entity. This emphasis on process and the various way types of flows, flows of capital, people, institutions, was a hillmark of his approach to community. It also points to how changes in one neighborhood can have implications for other places in the city. In fact, right now, uh, my research team, the Social Impact of the Arts Project, or SIA, has uh, been doing some work uh, along Lancaster Avenue here in Philadelphia. The building boom in University City is simultaneously encouraging new cultural activity farther up Lancaster, but at the same time threatening the community life of many longtime residents. So that way activity in one community can have these spillover effects on other communities, I think is a really central point. Jeremy identified four elements of this architecture of community, social capital, the trust and mutuality that are, as he put it, the relationship glue through which individuals, families, and social networks navigate economic opportunity, social conflict, and institutions. Second, public assets and infrastructure that can enhance or detract the efforts of local residents and institutions. Third, and I think this really drove a lot of his thinking at the time, private economic assets and market relationships, which have a particular role in low wealth neighborhoods, where again, in Jeremy's words, creating and uncovering asset value provides families and entrepreneurs with increased opportunity. And finally, going back to that notion of process, the flows of information, capital, and people uh, that was at this, uh, an, again, one of the things that pulled together this uh, architecture of community. Those of us who worked with Jeremy recognized that when he wrote this, 
he was on his good behavior, which wasn't always the case. Uh, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to resist uh, giving an in, uh, incident since I know everyone who knew Jeremy has two or three of those. For example, uh, he mentions public assets without criticizing public officials for their short-sighted budget decisions. He notes how strong social capital can sometimes block development projects without suggesting that community leaders might have corrupt motives. Yet the, the one thing that bothers me is that the metaphor of the architecture of community seems a tad more top down than it should be. This is the perspective of an investor looking for ways to change a neighborhood, not residents who want to stabilize it. It's a strategy for individuals and communities who have modest resources and want to translate them into affluence, not the, its poorest families and neighborhoods. The perspective that a perspective that began with the perspective of residents in those poorest of neighborhoods might reach a very different assessment of which assets, risks, challenges, and threats, and how culture can contribute to their lives, whether or not it brings prosperity. So I, I totally support what Marlon and, and Don have already pointed out, which is how central Jeremy's thinking was in terms of moving this forward. But uh, uh, you know, I do think that uh, uh, in some ways, uh, uh, elements of uh, especially around uh, uh, who's in the community and how the different perspectives in that community might function is something that probably uh, could have been more elaborated in, in what he wrote about it. Thanks. Well, that, that, that is a, uh, that's a very provocative uh, uh, opening, Mark. Thank you, uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm gonna pause before we go any further. I do want to. I do think it's important to acknowledge that um, that um, Jeremy's wife, Ms. Colin Nowak, uh, is is uh, is present with us today. Thank you so very much for joining us, and uh, and also um, and and also Jeremy's co-author, uh, my my good friend Bruce Katz, is on the line with us today today as well. Welcome to you both. Wanted to wanted to acknowledge you. Let's get back to um, uh, to Mark's. Uh, first kind and then fighting words. Um, and I want to turn to I want to turn to to Jamie. Jamie, architecture of community, the unique role of artists. Um, he Jeremy ID makers before there were makers, and that the process of com that that community building is is a process and that is not static. But speak to Mark's uh, some of Mark's points, in particular this notion that Jeremy's theory of the case uh, of architecture of community was. Was, was more down, was more top down uh, than it should be. What, what, what do you make of that, Jamie? Yeah, so uh, the thing that I sort of love about Jeremy is that like uh, many of us, he sort of contains contradictions. And um, there was a t-shirt I once bought at the University of Chicago bookshop that said, you know, that's all well and good in practice, but does it work in theory? And in many ways, I think that, you know, it sort of sums up, you know, Jeremy sort of didn't let theory or complex theories of change get in the way of good things that were happening on the ground. And Jeremy, I think better than many of us, understood that the people who hold power and resources in community weren't really so in touch with how folks were living on the ground. And oftentimes, uh, you know, I've sort of said philanthropy talks about its work often as giving voice to the voiceless, which is sort of ridiculous because I've never met a community without a voice, but I've met a lot of people who hold power and resources who don't seem to have ears. And I really think of Jeremy's work as giving ears to the earless and sort of making legible to those in positions of power how things actually happened on the ground. So my sort of connection, my um, debt to Jeremy goes back to his friendship and relationship with a person called Joan Shigakawa. And Joan was the, was the person at the Rockefeller Foundation who invested in some of this work um, and made it happen at the reinvestment fund. I was then fortunate enough to join Joan at the National Endowment for the Arts. She was appointed senior deputy chairman under the Obama-Biden administration. Um, and she really took this, this work, this 
theory of the case, this architecture of, of how communities work, and the fact that artists help contribute to the social, economic, and physical um, uh, conditions of a society, and put it into practice in a, in a grant program. And it's still happening at National Endowment for the Arts. It's called Our Town. And it invests in projects where a nonprofit arts organization partners with a unit of um, city government, municipal government, tribal government, and invests in artists as allies in um, making changes to the physical, social, and economic conditions of, um, of their communities. I was then fortunate enough in, in a rare case of the private sector adopting public sector innovation to help take some of this work that, that we experimented with at the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership um, with the U.S. Conference of Mayors and create what ended up being a 10-year fund called Art Place America. So we were capitalized at about $150 million. Uh, we did our work over about 10 years to invest in artists as allies in um, equitable community development. And in, you know, one of the most Jeremy Nowak of things, um, when Jeremy went to the William Penn Foundation, he actually made William Penn's first grant to Art Place America, which was unlike anything I think the William Penn Foundation had done. Uh, when he left um, the William Penn Foundation rather spectacularly, he actually became the interim executive director at Art Place America and so managed the relationship uh, with the William Penn Foundation and successfully negotiated a renewal. Um, and then he really sort of laid the groundwork for me to come in along with my colleague Liz Crane, who I think is logged in today, and a bunch of other folks, and sort of lead that work. And as Marlon and Mark and others have said, you know, Jeremy was really the person who said the economic argument for the arts is both false, right? If we're just talking about sheer dollars, that's not a strong enough case for why we need arts and culture central to community development. And it's disingenuous because of all of these other things that arts and culture can do to help drive transportation equity, to help create more quality jobs, to help communities become more welcoming to their newest members. So I was lucky enough to sort of work uh, across sort of 240 communities in the US that were putting into practice what Jeremy and Mark and others sort of laid out in this architectural framework. So look forward to diving into that more. Into practice, this architecture, this 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 framework. June Lee would be very keen to get your perspective on what uh, what Mark and Jamie have offered these of the not just Jeremy's uh, not just Jeremy's foundational argument, but the ways in which you've seen that ramify since he since he made it. Thanks, Marlon. Um, let's see. This is such an interesting panel because I feel like it's the simultaneous walk back in time, but also a, a kind of audit of how we're all doing now, <laughs> because there's a lot of interconnection here. Um, but let, I'll, I'll say a, a few things that I think connect to uh, Mark and to Jamie's points um, from my perspective. Um, and I think it's important to note that I, I first met Jeremy around the time that the reinvestment fund was um, beginning to publish these briefs about its work in support of art centered community development. And at that time, I was leading a 10 year project called leveraging investments in creativity, which was focused on improving conditions for artists in the United States by focusing on the things they need to build their artistic practice. So in this vein link. Uh, Link's work invested in projects and organizations that address things like artist space, training, direct support, information networks, um, all issues of community development. And for Link specifically, um, its goal was to understand how to improve these structures um, specifically for artists. But because of uh, because Link's work was stretching beyond the typical not-for-profit not arts sector to explore these issues, Connecting with Jeremy Novak and Ira and Mark and Susan at that time was uh, just deeply informative to Link's work and really important um, by extension to how I was developing as a professional and how I the kinds of information and frameworks that I could carry through as I moved over into philanthropy. And now, once again, as I'm leading an arts-focused uh, organization, 
And just, you know, as we move through this conversation, um, you know, while I am the president and CEO of United States Artists, I, I just want to take one quick step back to that context, because I think it provides some insights to how this all kind of coalesces as, as different fields of practice um, and sort of like a Venn diagram to the connection points that we all share. So it's important to note that um, the reinvestment funds work was being published really right on the heels of other really important work, namely that of Dr. Mar Maria Rosario Jackson, who is now the chairperson of the National Endowment for the Arts, who from her position at the Urban Institute at that time had also been working with the Rockefeller Foundation to measure arts and cultural participation at a community level. This was really important research that set forth principles to frame how one might look at participation at a neighborhood level. And again, as a young professional thinking about systems, we were pulling in both the wisdom of Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson and the wisdom of TRF and how it was thinking about investment structures. And you really can't separate those two viewpoints from my mind and I'll explain why. Um, you know, Dr. Jackson's work offered guiding principles that helped people working in the space of neighborhood development to approach their work from a decidedly local perspective. So very similar to um, Jeremy's view. And in her 2003 report, Art and Culture and Communities, she offered the following kind of principles, that definitions of participation depend on the values and the realities of a community that participation spans a wide range of actions, disciplines, and levels of expertise, that creative expression is infused with multiple meanings and purpose, and that opportunities for participation rely on art-specific and other resources. And now I'm offering this because it provides the right tension, I think, to the lasting work of Jeremy and how it may or may not consider the very perspectives and approaches that might arise when the starting point is community members and neighbors ahead of conventional community development goals. That how you frame that engagement that Don and Mark and Jamie are referring to is, is really, really important. And the resources that are required um, to begin that kind of um, knowledge development and information exchange is really important. And the sequencing of understanding existing cultural participation and the context of a neighborhood is the essential starting point, particularly when investors are maybe not of that neighborhood or from a, or may not have the kind of resident perspective um, that carries that kind of neat, deep knowledge of a place. Um, that's incredibly important, particularly when one of the central goals is to invest in ways that help support racial and social equity in a neighborhood. And so I, I feel very fortunate and quite debted to Jeremy um, for the attention that he afforded me when I was getting started with my work um, because he often offered a very candid picture of the ways that a CDFI could approach arts and culture inclusive strategies. And while, you know, from, you know, this girl's uh, perspective, sometimes it didn't always center some of those, like, really deep seated neighborhood kind of um, cultural knowledge. Um, it definitely just accomplished tremendous things that made legible the value and the potential of CDFIs in support of arts and culture. And I just want to end on a personal note um, uh, that, you know, Jeremy, you know, I only saw Jeremy on his best behavior. And I feel like I sort of missed something else that um, would have been uh, quite entertaining and fun to observe. But he was always very just exceptionally kind to me. And I recall a moment when I was really struggling with my goals to build support for arts and culture and specifically artists. Um, and I recall I was like spinning a little bit and I was feeling particularly pessimistic about, you know, how the failures of arts and culture and how it's, it couldn't really be measured against really important things like public education and safety from a community perspective. And Jeremy just stopped me and he said, you know, you are approaching this the wrong way. And that while you may not have the data to support the value of arts and culture over and above how people think about neighborhood goals, I tell people to just close their eyes and imagine a great place. And notice that arts and culture are an important characteristic of that place. And so I'll just, I'll stop there and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Thanks, uh, Judy Lee, you've given us a lot, a lot to, to consider, and we're and, and, and we're going to dive in uh, 
uh, into that momentarily. Um, I'd like, however, just to uh, ensure that everyone um, who was on, um, feel free, please, to put your questions into the Q&A, and we're going to try to integrate those questions, feed them to, um, to, to our panelists so that we can, um, we can make this as interactive as possible since we're doing this, uh, since we're doing this virtually. Um, I, want, um, I want to turn quickly uh, to Dawn, back to Dawn, because, uh, Julie, you really, you, as I said, gave us a lot to consider um, leveraging investments in, in, in creativity. I'm particularly curious uh, as we as we move forward to to learn more about the confluence of of the research you mentioned Dr. Jackson's work in, in 2003 that the sequencing of the work that's undertaken is is critical and how engagement is framed is is absolutely essential Don um if if you could say a few words about sort of at a high level where CDFIs sit now versus where they did and how we um what, what sort of evolution we've seen um, relative to Judy Lee's point about some of the change that we've seen um, that's flown from the from the research community in particular? Um, so I have a fair amount of disappointment about where CDFIs are in um, communities, connecting communities and arts through their investing. Um, in the early days, uh, almost no one would say that they were devoting energy specifically and aiming for it. It was like, if you find it, you might do it. And it was largely because arts were viewed as grant funded programs, low or no revenue programs, um, and weren't seen as easily financeable. And that's not always the case. And as our, as our sophistication grew in how we could be relevant, um, that changed. Uh, it also changed over the years as the kinds of capital in the capital stack for a kind of a physical arts project changed. And um, we were much more relevant CDFIs with the advent of new markets tax credits and folks becoming a little more sophisticated and you know, in the early days beginning to learn about historic tax credits and things like that. Um, but in the early days, most of our arts work was bridge lending. We bridged NEA money, which was like moved like molasses um, it also moved like molasses because artists didn't get their financial reports in on time. You know, so there was all this need for kind of managing slow money. And that was really our role for a while. There are peers of ours now who very much specialize in and have a whole lot of credibility in this space. And that was not the case, say, 20, 25 years ago. But it has not become as rich a vein as some other things that we've done. And I've always felt like there needs to be a, um, a little more coalescing of community of practice. I really think the art place days were the heyday. Um, it, you know, it, it does feel like a peak moment, um, the, both the Jeremy wind up to it um, and it's 10 years. Um, and I've, I've also been pleasantly surprised the degree to which when we look at healthy communities and we think about community and wellness, arts always shows up. It's always in the pipeline. It's always part of a community's multifaceted strategy for how to, how to engage, how to um, communicate and educate. Um, but I really feel like the CDFI space still hasn't matured as much as it could in this space. So it still feels challenging to attract the attention of peers when we need more than one of us. And I feel like projects don't always find um, the right kind of early capital partner that we could be. Okay. Well, I think Don, that's that's a good gives us an opportunity within this within this discussion to consider how those changes uh, might be undertaken and and the kinds of work that can inform and be uh, be catalytic of of that change. I want to go uh, turn back. Uh, quickly to Mark. Um, Mark, I think you had uh, a point that you wanted to raise vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Judy Lee's earlier comments. Uh, thanks, Marlon. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, as Judy Lee was going through Maria Jackson's uh, piece, uh, you know, this notion of there being a very different perspectives on what's going on in a community as it takes on uh, 
culture and community development issues. Uh, one of the things that jumped out to me is a very different sense of time, you know, that, that especially in terms of some of the outside interests who come and are interested in doing something in a community, they're operating on a sense of time, which might be months or, you know, weeks maybe. Uh, and that very often people in the community have a very different notion about how, you know, I've, I've been in discussions where, well, to use a personal example, where my university has done something in West Philadelphia that uh, offended residents and a variety of other groups, uh, as if it happened yesterday. I mean, it might have happened 10 years ago. And I do think this notion of being sensitive to different people's sense of time and how that plays in to the kinds of interactions you need to do community-based work in this area. So I just, I just wanted to pick up, on, pull that out from Judy Lee's uh, talk. Uh, Jamie, I wanna uh, pivot to you quickly. Uh, to what degree does Mark's, does Mark's point, um, does that trigger some, some thinking, some memories? Uh, does that set the context uh, for, for some of the work that you have, that you've seen done in, in other places and if so how? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, one of the big things that Jeremy um, sort of taught me was how important it is to equally value both experience and expertise. And to Mark's point, it's the expertise, it's the professional folks who sort of come in and tend to think in 12 month, you know, this is a grant cycle, this is a term, this is whatever. But those of us with experience, those of us who live in communities, you know, my, my mother, my grandmother and I were all born in the same parish in Cleveland, Ohio. So we've got a 60 year history that we're thinking about and 60 years of experience that informs us. And one of the things that I think was so important, and I'd love to keep this over to Judy Lee in a second, about Jeremy sort of doing this work from, um, from the reinvestment fund and thinking about CDFIs, was not just thinking about philanthropic capital, was not just thinking about the 12 month grant cycle, but was also thinking about capital stacks. And when Judy Lee was at the Cerdna Foundation um, before William Penn, I think you actually helped architect a program with Regina Smith at Kresge that invested in some CDFIs around the country that were doing this work. Um, so Judy Lee, I don't know if you want to talk more about that. I, I think, uh, thank you, Jamie. Um, yes, when I, I, from Link, I moved over to the Cerdna Foundation, which is a family foundation that works um, nationally. Um, and we partnered with the Kresge Foundation and Regina and I, you know, we're sort of scratching our heads and asking the same questions around the role of um, CDFIs in building a more diversified capital stack that could invest in these kind of art centered community development projects. And part of that, you know, just to provide a little bit more context was as much in reference to like this growing interest in philanthropy to think about how it could purpose its corpus, its endowment um, in different ways that um, were separate from um, what uh, the investment side of the house likes to call 100% loss rate of grants um, <laughs> to look at things like uh, uh, program related investments and so on. And so, you know, Regina and I were sort of scratching our heads and wondering like, how can we frame this in a way that would help us understand the opportunity for arts and culture, which for many of you who work in this space, and as Don sort of pointed to is a really hard thing to kind of wrap your arms around if you're looking at this from an investment or a banking perspective. And I think, you know, what we learned, what the attempt was to learn from practitioners. So actually to send out a call and ask CDFIs how they were kind of addressing, you know, what was inspiring them about this space and how were they address, addressing it from their resource perspective. And I think that, you know, what I would take from that experience and I, you know, we should call Regina Smith into this uh, conversation in many ways because Kresge's work continues to do really important work on the investment side um, in relationship to arts and culture. But what I would say, having gone from CERNA then to William Penn and in thinking about the, the kind of ways that you can invest in communities, you know, all of it's important. All of it is important and the flexibility of it is incredibly important. And I, there's never, you know, I, I can't underscore, I represent an organization that provides unrestricted funding to artists uh, and 
you know, the, the incredible um, returns, if you will, on that investment, you know, can't be understated. But from the perspective of, and from the perspective of other ways of um, investing in community development, you know, we have to consider how everything from, you know, contributed support from grants and donors can be blended with, you know, more complex forms of investments that CDFIs can carry. I also would, you know, I would also would just call into this space that CDFIs can also, if they begin to think more dimensionally about their own capital stock, could do things that look more like blended capital where, you know, maybe the first investment is in the form of a grant because you're getting, you're trying to create those preconditions um, to uh, follow on with other kinds of investment that, um, that will only be successful if you first pay attention to what's going on and to shore up the fundamentals of a neighborhood and to recognize the assets that pre-exist the community development efforts. Yeah, this is help, uh, really, really helpful. I'm, I want to, uh, Don, I'm, 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 I'm keen to get your perspective on, on what, what G. Lee has, has just framed. I'm interested in particular in um, in what Jamie said about this, the, the experience versus expertise um, dichotomy and balance, because it strikes me, I don't know if you agree with this, but as a general matter, experience tends to sit in some places, whereas expertise tends to sit in others, and the former is often devalued relative to the latter. This raises a lot of questions about um, about how we think, this, this raises a lot of equity focused questions as we think about the complexity of, of capital stack development. Don, you want to maybe, maybe touch on that a little bit? Sure. Well, um, you know, for us, uh, expertise is hard to compromise on. So we probably tilt in that direction and we would pretty pretty suspicious of a transaction that came with to us with a lot of um, theoretical thinking um, and not experience. Um, those are the hardest transactions to lift off the ground. They're the ones that have a fair risk profile around not really being connected to the community. I think where um, some one example of how that plays out in our work is, you know, our goal is really to build expertise at this um, through repeated transactions. So when we find uh, uh, a community that is very interested in the arts, um, we tend to do more than one project there. Uh, so we've been very busy in New Orleans, a community that is deeply um, rooted in how arts plays out in their local culture, in their community assets. Uh, we are currently uh, helping to finance the renovation of the Dew Drop Inn, you know, a green book historic performance venue and hotel. Um, that's probably our fourth arts project in New Orleans, um, where we, you know, uh, the expertise builds, it, it's exponential. Once you get success under your belt, and it doesn't have to be the same development team, it's really about the town or the, or the neighborhood executing and seeing success. And then others are made more ambitious by that. And we feel like part of our job is to make as much success across the finish line as possible to create the role models and to create the, the typologies that then others can take and transplant elsewhere. Um, that was one of the cross pollinating hopes, right, of Art Place, as well as a lot of independent art funders was like, if we do it once and we do it three times, you know, who else then comes to the party and begins to make the lifting easier? And do the execution teams uh, have an easier time as well? Um, so we always tilt, I think, more towards um, experience at projects than subject matter expertise. I think your phrase, uh, your phrase, Don, who else comes to the party? And it takes us back to Mark's, uh, Mark's earlier point about, the, about Jeremy's, uh, Jeremy's approach. And, and Mark's concern that it may have made, in, in his view, have been more top down than it, than it should be. Um, but the, so the question about who else comes to the party puts a particularly fine point, I think, on the, on, on the, equity, uh, on the equity question. And we, you, raise, uh, you raise New Orleans, of, of course, uh, as, a, as a wonderful example of, of where we think nationally we're 
were focused on, um, or had the opportunity rather nationally to become attentive to the needs of communities of color vis-a-vis an equity agenda and, and, the, and the reconstitution of, of, of New Orleans after the, after the disaster there. I'm wondering, um, Mark, do you wanna do you wanna weigh in on the ways in which we should be thinking about um, community development investment in the arts so that those investments have um, a greater connection to some of the equity challenges that 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 we are that we grapple with? Well, I'm happy to, Marlon. Uh, you know, um, one of what struck me, and a lot of this has come from working with Jeremy and then, uh, you know, Ira Goldstein, who heads the policy solutions at Reinvestment Fund, and I talked together for a number of years. One of the things that jumped out to me was there's, there was a whole set of policies uh, uh, that were very close to Jeremy's heart that were focused essentially on what I think of as the second fifth of the income distribution, not the absolute poorest people, our poorest neighborhoods, but people who had some, who were what, what I think of as struggling and diverse sections of the city. You know, charter schools, uh, uh, investments in you know low-income housing credits, a whole variety of those. Uh, really, if you want to look where those are going to have leverage, it's very often these in in these neighborhoods that are struggling but not absolutely uh, uh, devastated. Uh, now, one of the ways uh, I've, I've thought through how you can move from, from that strength to actually addressing the profound problems of very poor neighborhoods in American cities, I actually got from a, another reinvestment fund alumni, uh, Sean Klosky, who uh, talked to us about how in doing his work in Baltimore, he always thought about looking for points of strength and then building out from those. And I know in our work uh, that we did in New York City, uh, one of the points we said was there, there are a variety of neighborhoods that sort of fit into that uh, struggling and diverse uh, category that we found that we, we call them, and Sayaf calls them civic clusters. That is neighborhoods that have more cultural assets than you would expect given their modest economic situation. And one of the things we suggested was that you could see those as points of strength and then you know, build from strength, move from those into uh, more poor neighborhoods. Because I've got to say, uh, in many ways, I'm more, I guess I'd say pessimistic uh, about what's going on in American cities because Despite the fact that you know we're all talking about the importance of equity, we're all talking about investment in poor neighborhoods. The reality is that uh, uh, economic inequality has been this tidal wave that has been washing over our entire world, really, but our country in particular, uh, and which really none of us have really come up with uh, a, a way to respond to. So, but I, but as I said. This notion of starting at points of strength and then moving into lower income areas from those struck us as one way of thinking about how you might do that. Um, I'm sensing I'm, I'm sensing pretty strong disagreement coming from Jamie on that point. Uh, not uh, yes, loving disagreement. So I think I might just push back on sort of who sees strength where, right? And um, how you name a community and how you name the situation of community often predetermines the solutions that you'll arrive at. Right. So I've spent a long time in New York City and New York City has a lot of people who want to live there and not a lot of housing stock. And we talk about that as a housing problem. Right. But if you look to the global south and you look at the exact same situation, we name that as overpopulation. Right. So in New York City, we see the strength of the population and the problem is housing. Oftentimes in the global south, we see the population as the problem. And I think there's something in this sort of being surprised that arts and culture exists in low and moderate income neighborhoods 
is one of the things we need to get at because Don, you made such a good point that one of the things that's really amazing about what the reinvestment fund did was to sort of create this playbook. Look, we invested in these projects and you can do it too. I think the problem is that people often copy the wrong part of the example. So what they said was, oh, that's a museum. A museum owns a lot of real estate. It operates like these other entities. We know how to pencil out that deal. Let's invest in more museums. But I think the real thing that they should have copied is the fact that culture, right, deeply rooted arts and culture is actually risk mitigation. And it was Kim Dempsey, who's now at one of the National Housing Partnership Organizations, who was also at Kresge, um, who was the one who sort of taught me about this. If you were looking at a project in a low and moderate income neighborhood, if it's deeply rooted in the generations of folks who've lived there, that's actually risk mitigation that you can take to a risk committee and explain why this is a good investment because nobody in the community is going to let that project fail. And so art, the presence of arts and culture is actually a leading indicator, like I always get my indicators mixed up, is an indicator that this is a project that's deeply held by the community and the community is going to see it succeed and it's not going to foreclose. So I think the more we sort of let go of sort of describing communities by what they don't have, in many cases, access to capital because of the systemic and structural barriers that we've erected over the last 400 years, and instead doing the sort of asset first approach you know, I don't describe my grandmother and my mother's neighborhood in Cleveland as low income. I describe it as a Polish Catholic neighborhood, right? It was defined by our arts and cultural practices, by what we ate, by how we prayed, by what we sang, by the nursery rhyme. So that's just, I might sort of, you know, dichotomies are really useful. And I think it's really important that we sort of get them right. As risk, did I hear you correctly, Jamie? Culture is as risk mitigation in a deal? Yeah, I really truly believe that if you take a project and say this is how deeply rooted it is in the cultural fabric of the neighborhood, you can actually use that to talk about why this is not a risky investment. Why no way Judy Lee is buying this. No, I, I actually or me. <laughs> I mean, I I I disagree with Jamie on many, many things daily, but this is not one of them. <laughs> but I, I actually want to call into the space just that um you know, there is a really important white paper that the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank published in 2007 that actually laid out, and I would, you know, I, I, I quote it all the time, uh, chapter two of this incredible white paper actually talks about, from the SF Fed's perspective, that arts and culture, again, lays preconditions that enables follow-on investments to be that much more successful and to lower the risk of those investments. And they're talking about investments, you know, um, a, a very large scale in neighborhoods where they're trying to address deep kind of health and human service issues. Um, so, you know, I think that this actually is, uh, is, is well-documented and some, something that needs to be taken seriously. And I also just wanna, while I'm talking, just take us back to New Orleans, because I, I think that there's something really instructive in what we can learn from um, the, you know, now decades of investment from philanthropy in that city to ask ourselves, you know, what are the, cult, are the cultural, um, are the cultural practitioners, the Mardi Gras Indians who, act, who create such distinction, uh, such character in that city, and, and really undergird some of the really important economic drivers like tourism in that city, are they financially better off? Or have we created a system that doesn't actually honor the core assets of a city well enough to create sustainable structure so those practices will continue and the distinctive qualities of New Orleans will endure? That, I, I'm gonna jump in there because actually, Julie, you are, you're tagging on a question that's, uh, that we have in the Q&A, which, um, which asks about Jerry's, uh, Jeremy's thoughts about the risk of arts investments uh, spurring um, and the, in quotes, these quotes are mine, gentrification. Um, I think raising, you wanna just quickly speak to, speak to that and push on your point a little bit? Yeah, 
Well, I think, you know, there, I'm sure Don and others, and particularly Mark, who's been studying this from, um, from their perspectives much longer than I have, um, who has really just observed it more anecdotally and as, an, as a foundation person, um, which is, you know, sometimes has a limited view. Um, but I think that if you don't take into, con into consideration the, the kind of um, the time horizon of your investments and what needs to happen in advance of maybe physical improvements and other kinds of infrastructure improvements that we often associate with community development to start first at a very granular sort of grassroots level and considering like what are the assets in a neighborhood and how do we support those first, which may not be legible to most, to ensure that there is a strength there to, for residents and community operators to act on their own behalf and ensure that their that affordability and other issues are in place as these follow on investments take place. Now, there are lots of, you know, I think we also have to have a conversation about the larger policy arena in which these projects take place and whether or not those are those are well attenuated to keep some of the um, important aspects of racial and cultural equity in mind. But, uh, I'll leave that to the experts to take on maybe in uh, talk number two. Mark, I'm going to get to you uh, in a moment, but I, I, as uh, out of respect for my my CEO, I have to go back to to, to Dawn, who I, I sensed had terror struck in his heart when he heard the phrase "culture as risk mitigation." Dawn, well, it it can be um, anything that can be in strength can also. Uh, be the opposite, right? So too much of a strength, like there's a reason why people don't foreclose on churches, they're sacred, right? So you can have too much strength in an art asset such that it's on worthless collateral because you know you could never foreclose on it, it's sacred ground. Um, you know, no one's gonna foreclose on um, some of the assets near MLK's church in Atlanta, right? And yet we're financing there, but you kind of know that it's theoretical collateral, right? Um, so it can go both ways. Um, it, you have to underwrite uh, that it's valuable, but maybe not sacred. <laughs> and, um, and that value, you know, it's not about the collateral, it's about the strength. Like, how are you measuring uh, that this is a facility, an institution, a space that the community values? And that's what SIAP is so good at, right? Uh, you know, in the early days, we were very focused on super community art space, right? It was very obvious that the users of the space, the people who valued it, the people exhibiting it, the people performing were local. Um, and then we had this other opposite thing, kind of the Painted Bride, right? Um, which was regional. And um, it was a little gentrifying in, in, in a sense, not particularly where it was. Um, but we, you know, we have to look at the board composition and the attendance and who they're drawing from and who shows up when they blow the whistle that they need help. And if that's regional uh, or beyond regional, uh, you then have to ask yourself, you're really supporting a regional cultural institution. That's totally different underwrite, right? Um, than a community arts underwrite. And I think it's pretty obvious, but it's not well delineated. That's what, you know, Jeremy's later work in kind of, being prescriptive about what was uh, the, the essential features of this community building artwork um, was very helpful. Um, and it's, you know, it's not specifically in our underwrite, but it's the kind of resource you go to when you want to understand where the project strengths come from. But there is the opposite. There is, there, there is gentrifying art. There is also kind of the opposite, you know, we saw in Philadelphia, and you know, maybe I'm the only holder of this opinion, but a romanticization of blight uh, with broken shards of glass glued up everywhere all over Philadelphia. And, you know, the semiotic is junkyard broken glass as art attached to people's homes without permission. Um, so it's kind of like blighting gentrified art. <laughs> and so there's, there's many, you know, it's got, it's three sixties, it's got three dimensions to it. And it can be many different things in how it shows up. Um, yeah, Don, you're, you're, you're touching on a question that, that's in the Q and A, which asks generally, are you, are you currently investing in affordable housing projects that prioritize artists and space for, uh, for rehearsal and, and, and artists? I think you've, 
kind of you've you've helped us understand how to take that question and sort of blow it out to the broader to the broader context. And, and we we can we can get back to that in a moment. But I want to turn back as promised to Mark. Mark, you you you've had a, a very studied gaze here for the last few minutes, listening to your to your colleagues. I, I'd invite you to take this in, in any direction that you want and feel free to agree with or litigate some of your some of your colleagues' points, please. Well, I, I wanted to go back to another, something else I learned from Jeremy uh, from the work we did together, which was this importance of discovery, uh, which I thought I, I, I was thinking of when Judy Lee was talking that, you know, it's not like these assets in neighborhoods are just uh, waving flags so you know where they are. And I think Jeremy made a, a, an important point that, that one needs to go look for these. I, I was just thinking, you know, uh, uh, just last week, uh, we're, we're trying to do a refresh of some of our data in Philadelphia. And something which I hadn't expected to see was this uh, really increase in the number of nonprofit cultural providers along uh, 52nd Street uh, uh, in West Philadelphia. Now, uh, for those of you who are Philadelphians, you know that 52nd Street has a very long history of, uh, of, of being a center of African-American cultural activity. Uh, it went through decades really in which that, that was in decline. And uh, then, you know, just uh, here, I'm just looking at like the past decade, we've seen this really increase in the number of cultural assets that are along there. And, you know, it's it, in terms of the gentrification issue and, you know, what I'm gonna say about that is first of all, that I try, I try not to use that. I try to talk about rapid neighborhood change and the various different kinds of neighborhood, of rapid neighborhood change that can occur in a particular city because you start using gentrification and the conversations, so it's sort of a shuts down right. conversation. Right. So first yeah. I wanna say that, but uh, uh, what I wanted to say was ironically, what our analysis of what was going on was that there was an extension of essentially what I would characterize as kind of ethnically and economically diverse cultural activity, kind of raiding me out west from, you know, University of Pennsylvania and University City, but was simultaneously being matched by a set of new cultural entities that were predominantly African-American and focused on 52nd Street. So that the, what you're finding there, I, I, this is at this point a hypothesis, is the fact that what, that what one might characterize as a gentrification wave coming out from University City and a set of activities going on in the neighborhood are actually feeding on each other rather than you know, working necessarily to destroy a neighborhood. So I do think it's important. I, one of the, you know, this importance of, of discovering that, that it's not all obvious, you have to go look for assets. And secondly, that, uh, you know, in terms of what other people have said, the, that there, there's ambiguity in terms of uh, the implication of those assets for the future trajectory of a neighborhood. Amy, the importance of discovery? Yeah, so I think in some ways this goes back to the um, experience and expertise, right? It's expertise that needs to discover what's on 52nd Street. Those of us with experience living on 52nd Street don't need the flags. And so I think what Marx is saying is exactly right, because when you bring sort of knowledge of the street, knowledge of the asset in combination with sort of the studied expertise, that's when the real magic can happen. And I love that Marx sort of doesn't use the frame gentrification because that's also one that we didn't tend to use. Instead of sort of lumping things together under the gentrification conversation, we tended to talk about three kinds of displacement that we regularly saw in neighborhoods. Um, you know, the first was physical. We still see city leaders, state leaders using eminent domain and other things to sort of remove blight and sort of produce public goods. So there are a set of folks that are physically displaced from their homes. 
There's financial displacement, which tends to be the kind of thing we name as gentrification, when um, property values go up without neighborhood income going up. So renters are displaced, or I can no longer afford to pay my property taxes, or my $1 cup of coffee now costs $6. But I think the third kind, the one that we really need to dig into is cultural displacement. Because one of the things that humans are really good at is knowing where we're welcome. And so there's a colleague we uh, in Los Angeles who often talks about a community development project that went up in the Echo Park neighborhood. And I think Echo Park is probably what, 88, 89% Spanish speaking. The new development project that went up had zero signage in Spanish. Right, So a very clear message was being sent about who that space was intended for, and it was not the Spanish-speaking residents who had lived there for a long time. Similarly, in New York City, you know, our uh, Mayor Adams is talking about bringing back some of Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor Giuliani's sort of policing, which were also really strong signals about who was who was who is welcome in public spaces in New York City. As a sort of able-bodied white man who often leaves the house in a suit, my presence in a public space was often seen as sort of lingering, and I was helping to enliven or or um, you know sort of zip up the public space. But other folks, particularly men of color were seen as loitering, not lingering, even though we were doing the exact same thing in the neighborhood. And a very clear message has been sent in New York City about who is and who is not welcome in our public spaces. So I think as the neighborhood coffee shop becomes the Starbucks, as the sort of local bike store just sells fixie bicycles, right? We're sending all of these signals about the cultural displacement and whose cultures are and are not welcome. So I love that sort of renaming of the gentrification and talking about what kind of rapid change is happening and what we like and who it's for. Very helpful. I, I am I'm 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 taking all of this in and I'm I'm still I'm still grappling a little bit with how we are or I'm I continue to be curious rather the ways in which we are taking this experience versus expertise dichotomy and and placing that in the framework number one of of you know this deal's got a pencil relative to the all of the impacts that come as a consequence of the importance of discovery, as Mark said, and the tension that would seem to sit between those, those two nodes of those two nodes of activity. Because I do think that we continue to be challenged. We're, we're sort of circling around this equity question, but I'm I'm not satisfied that I'm not satisfied that that, that any of you have none of you have given me satisfaction. Uh, as it relates to that question. So I wish you would do more. Well, welcome to the ambiguity uh, of art, right? Um, there, is no, there is no safe harbor underwrite for this. Um, this is the pornography test. You know it when you see it. You know by who's showing up, you know by who's governing it, you know by who's participating, whether or not it's culturally sensitive to what's already there or it's culturally tilting towards what could be there. Um, and it's, it's hard. And you can get it wrong. We've, I'm sure in our portfolio, we've gotten it wrong. You know, in, in uh, the work that Sue and I have been doing over the past year, uh, we struck upon this notion of kind of a new value proposition for arts and culture, which of course, the whole idea of a value proposition is something that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have even thought about. So that may be something I learned from Jeremy. Uh, we're all becoming neoliberals at some point, but uh, you know, essentially it says arts and culture is a right and that every community has a right to have its arts and uh, opportunities and access to arts and culture. Secondly, that that intrinsic value of arts and culture has a spillover effect in terms of other uh, elements of what we, we call social well-being uh, around health, around educational opportunity, uh, uh, around levels of social connection. And then thirdly, that uh, from what we can tell from the empirical data, uh, that, the, that those, bent, those uh, spillover effects particularly are visible 
in low middle and low income neighborhoods. So from our standpoint, it's that fact that there are spillover effects and that those spillover, well, those spillover effects uh, affect low in, and moderate income neighbor in particular, that is, is the selling point. I, I, you know, it's interesting if you go back to what Jamie was saying, uh, that first point that in a sense, everyone has a right to arts and culture uh, and, to def and to define arts and culture in a way that's appropriate for themselves and for their neighborhood. Uh, you know, I think is is you don't want to you don't want to lose that part of of it as well. And so anyway, twinning... I don't know if that it convinces Marlon, but that, <laughs> that's well, our and, shtick. And Mark, just twinning on that with rights with great rights comes great responsibility. And I think what's often left out is each of us has a right to see our own stories told, and each of us has a responsibility to know the stories of other people. And so when you twin those, right, you want to see diversity on the stage, as it were, and you shouldn't be able to look at the audience and tell what's happening on the stage, right? We should all know and celebrate each other's cultures. And some of us are lucky enough to have huge civic architecture devoted to the European diaspora cultures um, that are all over North America. So I love that. And, and thinking about that right twin with that responsibility is brilliant. So just to, just to clarify, arts and culture, the, the new value proposition is composed of three elements. Arts and culture is a right. There is intrinsic value that spills over that drives social well-being and said spillovers occur principally uh, or most visibly in low to moderate income neighborhoods. So I have that right, Mark? You can just nod. You're on mute. Yes? Okay, got it. Yes. Right. Well, that begs then that begs the follow-up question, Dawn. Um, if our does does this does does Mark's articulation of this new value proposition give us a um, an opportunity to leap over the pornography test, as it were? In other words, are we yet, are we in a position to measure the kinds of spillover effects? that Mark is describing so that Judy Lee's skepticism can be abated? I don't know. I do think there's, I think we have to modernize for today um, what the spillover effects are. I think they're actually magnified. I think from the time of Jeremy's arts writing to today, we have so much more digitized and so much more disintermediated and so much more reduced the importance of place that those institutions that still plant the flag culturally and activity-based and arts-based and engagement-based are even more rare. You know, uh, what is the town square anymore um, in a physical representation? And I think increasingly we're left with so many different um, business types and even nonprofit service types evaporating away that we're left with arts institutions as anchors. And they always were, but they, they, you know, they competed for anchor them with many other things, right? But for those arts institutions, which need to be a place, um, I think there's a lot less to rival them around being the heart of a community, which makes them even more important and even more important for us to understand them and study them so that uh, we can continue to grow them. Um, I do think there's a way to build a, you know, a box around the understanding of, you know, ask these seminal questions and feel, feel like you've understood where this group is coming from and where their, where their core is centered. Um, and um, for us, it's always been looking at the, uh, clientele slash participants, the governance and the management, and um, if they're of a place and um, centered in that place, um, uh, we're kind of safe. But even that, there, there are many communities that have rival cultures. Um, so you can really? get anything wrong. I think that we, I think, uh, you know, there's something, so I, I agree with what Don is saying. And I would take it a little bit further to some examples that we just experienced over the last two years during COVID. And so I'm not sure, uh, we can talk about measurement, you, you know, 
and, and try to, and it's always fun. I always enjoy listening to uh, scientists talk about how they would measure these things because they're actually incredibly diverse across the spectrum and range of things that happen. And I think that the pandemic actually demonstrated both how important arts organizations and artists are to our communities and how they would have completely failed by any measures that tried to, that attempted to try to understand like what their value might be like in the wake of, you know, enormous community strain. And I'll give you two examples. You know, the, the Wilma Theater here in Philadelphia had its artists go out and actually, instead of doing in-person workshops in senior centers where they could no longer go for safety reasons, safety for the seniors, you know, they would call, they would call the residents and, and create a human to human connection and maybe read a poem or re maybe talk about, a, you know, a piece of dramatic writing. But, you know, that is infrastructure. That's infrastructure that, that of the most basic human need that was completely stripped from um, so many lives during the pandemic. And I think another example is, you know, Asian Arts Initiative animated a safe spot for kids whose parents had to go back to work during the pandemic or who couldn't be at home to provide childcare so that kids could get a lunch and have a safe space to plug into their online learning opportunities. And like, you know, we, we continue, you know, it's almost a failure of the investor's imagination to trust that arts organizations and artists are going to figure it out and are going to navigate through the community needs that they're aware of and that they can respond to just like, you know, it, with, with really just the flip of a switch in many cases. I mean, practically, this is what we were seeing. And you know, when we try to put it into categories and when we try to overlay the specialized forms of investment that we've created, that's where I think we really see the system's failure. Well, Judy Lee, do you think that, you know, uh, I mentioned Jeremy had this notion of flexible uh, uh, funds in a development fund. Do you think, like, do you think we've missed that or that we haven't achieved uh, that notion that he had? I think that we should look at all of our resource structures, you know, how we support labor in this country, how we support the not-for-profit sector, how we understand its relationship to the commercial sector and to the larger economic drivers of not just cities, but the country as a whole, and kind of think more dimensionally from a philanthropy and an investor perspective of how you shore up, shore all of those things up, knowing that they're interconnected and that we can't, that it doesn't actually work to create you know, very specific, you know, very specific lines of investments in most cases, if you're trying to address holistic neighborhood, you know, holistic you know, neighborhood sustainability from an equity standpoint. You know, one of the questions that was put in the question box asked about like, is anybody thinking about the integration of arts and culture with STEM? Well, of, yes, <laughs> because we know that arts and culture has uh, has an important kind of effect in a child's education. But, you know, have we gotten precision around how to measure that? Maybe not. But we know, for example, from my time at William Penn working with Hillary Murray, that in her in the portfolio of arts education um, programs that she was funding, you know, she studied this working with Wolf Brown consultants and others and saw that like truism was decreased because arts and culture programs were in schools. And so like, we just aren't particularly gifted at understanding more of the kind of holistic ways that people navigate their lives and how they plug into these really important systems like education and the economy and so on and so forth. That it raises a question for me, Jimmy, go, go back and reflect on the, uh, the, 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 the art town experience and, and what, apropos of Judy Lee's points, what, in, in retrospect, uh, do you think you learned? Yeah, so one quick thing, and then I'll grab that. Just on the, C, on the STEM question, I just a reminder that arts and science used to be one activity, right? When da Vinci was working, those weren't two separate endeavors. They were actually twins. So uh, I think there's a lot that um, I think it's important for all of us who think in about community work 
to remember traditional knowledge as much as we spend time innovating and inventing new things, because we've already discovered a lot of the answers we need, we've just forgotten them. Um, in terms of the of the our town reflection, you know, one of the things that is a problem with the structure of a federal grant program is because of the way the NEA is allowed to fund, you're only allowed to fund um, nonprofit incorporated arts and cultural organizations. But arts and culture, as mediated by nonprofits, is a tiny little band of the spectrum, right? James Patterson and Beyonce are not being mediated by um, nonprofit arts and cultural organizations, but far more Americans experience them as arts and culture than we do with the Symphony of the Opera, sort of the ballet. So I think thinking about some of the structural um, categories we create that certain funds can only go to small businesses, certain funds can only go to major industry, certain funds can only go to nonprofit and corporate, certain funds can only go to individuals. So that notion of, of sort of Jeremy's importance that a dollar is a dollar is a dollar, that if you actually have control of your capital, who to deploy it to and how to use it without these, you know, I love that foundations pretend that somehow their 5% grant dollars are different than their PRI dollars are different than our MRI dollars are different than their investment dollars. It's really just a dollar. And so the more we can sort of recognize that money is money is money and people who have control over how to deploy their money are better able to make um, holistic investments because we're not trying to sort of fit our round pegs into the square holes of, of philanthropy and government. So I think the sort of how can we both be accountable to taxpayers because public funding, federal funding, state, local funding comes from taxpayer dollars. So that's a very high you know, I owe a lot to folks um, when I'm spending taxpayer dollars. And how do we twin that with the flexibility that recognizes that that's what we really need to do, um, I, I think is one of the things I would lend to sp spend more time doing, but I would need to sort of go back to the university and get a degree in procurement and uh, sort of actually figure out how to do all of those things. I wonder if that doesn't put, take us back to Mark's earlier point and the articulation of that value proposition. I mean, look, we like it or not, but to your point, Jamie, there's a there is a very there's a practical reality that we that we that we live in, and that these that as much as we wish that these dollars were entirely entirely fungible, we do have to you know we live within the constraints of public policy very very often, and I do think that Mark, your 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 the value proposition that you articulated and that spillover um, into 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 LMI neighborhoods is a, is a potentially interesting pathway to pursue, uh, given Jamie's last point. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll just, you know, one of the interesting things that we, you know, we we're here and except for Jamie bringing up the federal government, you know, we haven't really talked about like is there a role for local government and all of this. And I, I will say, you know, this is like a very personal experience. Is that like. You know, we we worked, we did a project in New York for about two years. And now when I talk to people at the Department of Cultural Affairs in New York, they they talk to me about SIAP neighborhoods, you know, neighbor, <laughs> whereas uh, in Philadelphia, uh, I think uh, like if I had a map, I could find City Hall. I mean, there's a way in which uh, uh, I think there, you know, there's a, a lot of variability in, that there, there should be an important role of local government in addressing the things we've been talking about. And I think there's a lot of variability as you go across the country in terms of the extent to which cities are prepared to think in those terms. I'm trying to be diplomatic. Well, I'm not good at it. Government just doesn't do dynamic well. So they tend to, you know, lock in. <laughs> roles, hence the 1% for art stuff. Um, was there an attempt at much of this from long ago? So um, I think NEA is a better place to hope for innovation, but then it's the stuff that happens outside of government that government can partner with. The real, we can really modernize um, what the world needs now. A, a very specific and, and entirely self-serving question for the group. <laughs> Um, as you know, 
here in Richmond, Virginia, over the course of the last several years, we've seen some substantial activity related to some very, very large monuments. Um, those monuments are no longer, no longer with us, but um, I am curious, um, I'm curious to hear from folks apropos of Don's, Don's last point. Um, how can we begin to, to kind of knit some of these threads, uh, tie some of these threads together that we've, that we've talked about here today and begin to present both to certainly the CDFI community and ecosystem, but also uh, from a public policy perspective, ways in which what you all have been working on and what you all have learned over the course of, 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 of your career and the ways in which Jeremy helped us understand at a deeper level and how his work informed yours. Are there ways in which you think we should be, we should be looking forward, whether with local government or, or, or other potential stakeholders? What are some, what are some forward, uh, forward directions that, that you think we ought to be really pushing on? I, can I, I, I think it starts, I think it starts with the citizens. And I say that because maybe because today I'm feeling incredibly optimistic, but I think the monuments, what you're talking about with the monuments is actually a really telling example where, you know, the monuments project actually started in Philadelphia. Paul Farber worked with the mural arts project to create this like really provocative public art program that brought local artists and some national artists together to work with residents to imagine like what what could replace or what could be brought um, to the to one's imagination about the kind of presence of art in different locations around the city? That project then informed work in New Orleans, which, as we all know, what made you know the headlines in terms of some of the in terms of one of its um, monuments to a Confederate um, soldier and and so you know in both of these examples it was artists and the kind of arts and culture infrastructure that helped move along you know, the imagination of folks in, in wanting to tell perhaps a different story or, a diff or provide a different perspective about how residents were feeling about their place and the history of that place and what they wanted to, what they wanted to bring to light um, to provoke the kind of consciousness of citizens in that place. And so, I, you know, I, I think that it, Marlon, I think that that was, a great example that you just provided that, you know, there's something there that that we sh that I think is fundamental. And then that can begin to move, you know, what the government and civic infrastructures look like. I mean, let's ask ourselves, like, why is New York different from Philly? Like separate from the dollar flows, you know, what is our civic infrastructure fighting for currently? I mean, oftentimes it feels more existential than it feels, you know, you know, uh, future facing, if you will. Yeah. And so I, I think that there's, I think that there's an imagination um, that needs to be stimulated among our citizens um, to think through what the future might look like. Wonderful. That's, that's a marvelous, kind of a, a very helpful beginning close out. Mark, did you have any, uh, did you have any kind of closing thoughts um, apropos of, of, of Judy Lee or other comments? Um. Well, um, I guess, I, you know, I think culture has uh, a lot of promise. I think Jeremy uh, was a very important person in terms of translating some of the, uh, some of the research that, you know, Joan Chicago at the Rockefeller Foundation had put out and really get it into the bloodstream of, of people who were doing investing and, and supporting. Uh, I do, you know, I mentioned earlier, I, I have a great fear that we haven't done anything in terms of addressing increased economic inequality across the board. And I see it as the great, really the great threat to, uh, to our country and to our cities. So, you know, I think, I think there's promise and there's threats. So, you know, it's the same as we always have. Don, any um, any kind of closing thoughts or comments? Uh, well, I'm very pleased to talk with you all about this. I uh, uh, your last question 
made me uh, recoil a little bit, uh, rejecting the expert, the question of experts when we should be questioning expertise and experience. Um, so uh, for us, our, part of our job is being reactive and being ready, um, uh, but also sussing out where we can find this work, um, but not being prescriptive. So it, it was my instinct to not answer that question of what's what's next because it, that answer doesn't come from a capital source. Right um, that answer comes from uh, different communities. I do think you know with the advent of this, um, we all have to rethink what civic engagement means and what art means, and how do we connect people to art? Um, it's multimedia, it's digital, and it's not place based often. And there are ways to anchor it, I think. Um, but sure. I haven't seen that much of it yet. Um, but I'm hoping that we see the next generations of it. Um, so. so before I turn it to Susan to close, I'll ask Jamie to offer a final comment as well. I'll just say, you know, the thing that I carry with me most uh, from Jeremy is sort of the unusual suspect nature of the people he pulled together. And just looking at the attendee list for this and seeing as many museum professionals as there are loan officers on the list, I just think is the testament when we bring together different kinds of expertise, different kinds of experience, different kinds of folks, because the six of us, I think, are a great example of we wouldn't be in this conversation but for Jeremy. And I know my world's a little better because of it. Well, thank the panelists very much for the opportunity. Wonderful discussion. Susan, I will turn it back uh, to you with, with all of our thanks. And I want to thank you, Marland, and all of the panelists, and particularly Don Hinkle Brown and the Reinvestment Fund and Ira Goldstein for being such wonderful partners in this exemplifying the incredible, provocative and creative partnership, which Jeremy always brought to his work along with his heart. So thank you so much to all. <laughs>